Good morning and welcome to Inner West Council Library. We present an HSC lecture series in partnership with First Class Tutoring. But before all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian of the land on which we produce this series, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Ura Nation and show my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, and to all First Australian watching this series with us. Enjoy and good luck for your exam after a very, very hard year. Hello, my name is Anthony Chidiak. I'm a teacher at Patrician Brothers College Fairfield, and today I'll present you a talk on HSC English. HSC English is different to the other examinations uh, that you'll encounter. It's, uh, it covers three particular areas. It could be English Studies, English Standard and English Advanced. Today, I will focus more on Paper 1. However, I will talk about aspects of Paper 2. We'll be covering text and human experience. It's a common module to advanced and stand courses and some students in the English studies course. So it is an important foundational unit. So there's a crossover there between those three subjects. So all people have to do elements of this particular examination. Paper two is different for all these other subjects, subject levels in English. So what does this module contain? Well, it's important to realize that it's a very logical module when it comes to English. Um, they have to choose a module that they've got enough ideas in that all books can extract something from this module in some form or shape. So human experiences is really about human beings and English, if you like, is about text. Text tell stories, communicate information about human beings and their human experiences. So whether it's about tragedy, comedy, love, resilience, perseverance, all these things are human experiences that work in English. They, they work very well. So it's a very broad heading. So let's look at human experiences. They can involve the individual or they can also involve the group. They can be common to people from different places and times or they can be very different. That is why um, within this, there can be a paradox. We see ourselves as separate human beings and yet we identify as human beings. So we want to be separate, but we also be, want to be part of the group. We talk about universal human experiences, things that unite us and bring us together. Yet we can also reject this idea when we celebrate the achievements of individuals. We celebrate these achievements through stories and the texts we share. Texts are a vehicle to represent human experiences through language, which is why we need to be able to find the language features. And this makes sense. Uh, storytelling, which has been part of human nature for thousands of years, is expressed and later on was written down. And this is what we have today in English. To understand how the meaning of humanity and human experiences is conveyed or represented. This is what texts do. The module says that you, the students, need to make increasingly informed judgments about how aspects of these texts, for example, context, purpose, structure, stylistic and grammatical features, and form, shape meaning. So, put simply, the text itself and the features within the text bring about a certain meaning. You need to understand the text to be able to talk about the ways or parts of that text that work together 
to capture our human experiences. Does it work? Yes, it does. But are we looking for the right things within the text to extract this information? So most of us will read a text, we'll know the storyline, but we need to go much deeper into that text to get a holistic understanding of that text. Once again, texts are where we find these paradoxical ideas captured, with some texts celebrating individuality and others saying it's better to be united. We are a team. And when we study texts in this module, we look for what the text is saying about humanity. What does the text value? Is it the individual? or the collective experiences? Is it a group of individuals that come together? How do we, how do our experiences affect us emotionally? What impact do they have on us? What human quality do we find in a text? Now, I said before, we do find plenty of human qualities in a text. If we do not find a human quality in a text, it's probably not a text or not a text of quality. Some further questions that we need to consider. Now, these questions are important because the more we look at them, the more we start extracting the deeper levels of the text. We explore them. What motivates a person? We also need to ask, how does the composer use language to convey this meaning? How does the style, structure and grammar of the text speak to us about human experiences? What is the composer's purpose in telling us this story in the context in which it is produced and consumed? Produced refers to when it was composed, put together by the artist or composer and consumed refers to when it is being read. How do we take that text in? What do we get from that particular text? Let's do this activity now and just to see, just to help us explore some of these ideas. List five beliefs about humans that you think everyone believes in. They're universal ideas or principles. And the second one, write a belief you have about humans that may not be common to everyone. So I'll give you a few minutes to ponder these questions and these activities. And you can use your book or your prescribed text to help you. All right, let's look at related texts. Now in the past, related texts were a big part of these examinations. Well, now they're not. It doesn't mean we don't need related texts, but we don't need them as we did before. They will be used for your assessments in class, but you will not need a related text in the HSC examination. Now, the good thing about that is you don't have to memorize all these extra texts. The bad thing is you could be studying a related text in class that you won't be doing for the HSC. But the related texts will be useful when you do the craft of writing, which is module C of that exam, where you have to draw upon your wider reading to compose uh, your response to this question, whether you're doing standard, advanced or English studies. The outcomes criteria. Now, when we come across this, we have to say, well, why are we worried about the outcomes? Well, the answer is we need outcomes because outcomes are what they use to put the exam together, to put the syllabus together, and finally to mark us as students. So if we understand the outcomes very, very well, it means we can give the outcomes what they're asking of us. That means we're on the same page 
as the examiners and we have that insight already. So we could be writing a lot of things in our answer that are basically missing the target. They're missing the outcomes. So we need to understand them. Let's have a look at these outcomes for texts and human experiences. All right, there's, there's three of them. It's to demonstrate understanding of human experiences in texts. So each question needs to consider the idea about human experiences. So it has to be about human experiences. If it's not about human experiences, then, um, and you're right about something else, then you're missing the target of that particular question. The second one is analyze, explain, and assess the ways human experience is represented in a variety of texts. So each question needs to consider the text itself. You need to delve into the text and look at how does the text explain things? What sort of evidence does it put forward to explain this idea about human experience? And you need to analyze that text and look at the effect of it and how it helps to draw out that idea. The last one is organize, develop and express ideas using language appropriate to the audience, purpose and context. So each question needs to consider the actual writing itself, your writing, you have to express yourself. How well do you write as a person? You might hit the human experiences, you might be able to have the text, but you might be a very poor writer. And that will separate you from the other students, the more capable students. These things are often written on the, the rubric. They're there. So you might say, they're not really asking me to do that, but they are. You need to know them well. They're not there as decoration. They're there to say to you, this is what we have based our exam on. We're looking for these things. Can you please produce these in your answer? And um, this is what we are looking as our marking criteria. So let's go through them again. We have to understand human experiences. We have to show an understanding of that. We have to use evidence from within the text and we have to analyze that evidence. And thirdly, we have to be good writers. We have to work on our writing skills, our, our ability to express ourselves, to be successful in this subject of English. Let's look at the exam structure. We need to be familiar with this exam structure. It has changed from previous years. This is the second year of this new syllabus course, and we need to um, be aware of it so that we can focus our attention and our efforts in excelling in this exam. So the first thing is paper one, is about texts and human experiences and it's made up of two sections section one is 45 minutes section two is 45 minutes um, and each section is made up of 20 marks so the total marks for this section is 40 if in the past it was worth 45 and it was made up of three sections so the creative writing is taken out of this section and it's, it has been placed in an area in paper two called the module C craft of writing. So if we look at it carefully, the first part is short answers that hasn't changed uh, reading of unseen passages. We don't know what they are. The more we read, the more we understand passages and we, the better we are at answering them. The unseen passage, passages and they require us to write short answers. Now it's different for each course with some questions crossing over between standard, advanced and English studies. Section two is the prescribed text response, which every person will in each school 
or be doing a different prescribed text. Extended response, usually an essay on your prescribed class text. The same questions will be there for all courses in that last question. It's a generic question which will allow you to talk about your own text. Paper two, which I'll cover some parts of today just to give you an overview of it. Now, this is made up of three parts and is worth 60 marks and they require you to do it in two hours. So each essay, if you like, or extended response, and there are three, module A, module B, module C, each part, uh, you are to allocate about 40 minutes and that gives you two hours. In standard English, it's called the first part, module A is called language, identity and culture. And for advanced, it's called textual conversations where you need to compare two texts, an original text and maybe a modern day version of that and look at how uh, they interpret a certain theme and give it more uh, relevancy uh, to today's world. Module B is a close study of a text for standard students, but it's a critical study of a text for the advanced students, where they look at distinctive features of that text that help to make that text so special. And module C is the craft of writing where it could be um, imaginative, uh, it could be a narrative, a short story, persuasive text, a discursive text. Um, it could be um, an extended response type essay. And it could be one section or it could be made up of two, of two sections where there's a response and there's a reflection on that response. So that's the tricky one. That's the one from left field that they've put in there to get people to think on their feet. So they can't prepare that much for an answer. And they will require wide reading to do well in that particular question. So let's look at the similarities across the papers. Some questions will be common between different courses, and we know that. Um, English study students may have one or two questions in common with English standard. English standard students may also have one to two questions in common with English advanced. But all the courses will have one or more questions just for their own particular course so that the papers will look very different. So you might get the paper and say, this looks exactly the same, but towards the end, they might have a different question. Maybe the first three questions are similar, then the last one or two are different. Now the short answer section has four to five questions, depending on which course you're doing. Um, and they're worth from one to seven marks with a total tally of 20 marks. The short answer questions, text and human experiences. All right. So this section we know that it will contain, will contain either four or five short answer questions, which will relate to a series of unseen texts related to texts and human experiences. Could be visual. It could be a fictional text or a non-fictional text. It could be poetry, a media article, a website, advertisement, poster, extract from a longer text such as a novel or play. So what I say to students is, even though you don't see the text, it's your job to brainstorm all the texts that you are familiar with. And there would be 15 to 20 different text types. And I would say, write down in general what the features of these texts are and some of the more common techniques in those texts. Study them, know them well, because when you come to one of these texts again in the exam, 
you'll be able to respond to it. You'll have this background knowledge, this insight already. So get that, put that together, and you'll see a big difference in your answers where you're not thinking on the spot. And thinking on the spot is good if you've got that knowledge to draw on because that'll save you a lot of time. If you're thinking and you're struggling, you'd be surprised how much time you lose in doing that. This section has a separate reading booklet. The reading booklet will contain extracts and short texts drawn from a range of text types. So sometimes you'll get this booklet and it's got a color picture in it. Well, most often when we do English, we always say it's a written text and that's the way we think. But there are some texts that are visual. So the question I ask is, are you familiar with visual techniques such as layout, such as vectors, salience, all these things that, that don't always come to mind when we, when we see a visual text because we're so often um, have in our mind the idea of a written text. Marks will add up to 20 with questions worth from one to seven marks each. We've said that the marks are a guide as to how much time to spend on each question. So if they're worth um, one mark, well, we won't spend too much time on that particular question. If it's worth five marks, then we will spend a bit more time because that section has 45 marks to it. So if it's worth five marks, we might spend 10 minutes on that particular question. So we have to work out a way of working through that system. So the way I look at it, it's 20 marks. If it's 20 marks and we have 45 minutes, each question is worth one mark. So we should be spending about two minutes per one mark question. And that's a rough guide. Questions may start with directions such as identify, describe, analyze, explain, or compare. And they're listed from the easiest to the less easiest questions. So you need to know what identify means. That seems like a low order type question. As, to pose, as opposed to, sorry, analyze, which requires more detail, more detailed description. While questions may focus on a single text, you may also be required to compare more than one text in response to a longer, short answer question, if that makes sense. That means synthesis, bringing ideas together from different texts. Short answer questions. The questions may start off with the word how. Now that means there has to be language analysis. How means how do they do it? What tools have they used? What techniques have they used? The questions will use words from the module description like paradoxes, anomalies, inconsistencies, representation or storytelling. So know what every word in the module description means and how it applies to particular texts. So they're, they're words that aren't easy because what they do is they, they cover complexities. They often cover, cover two or three things and they're two or three things that have to be weighed up to come about with a response. And that's not an easy type of question. So, Look at those, look at some ideas about human experiences and have them ready, have them at your fingertips. The questions may focus on a specific aspect of human experience, such as arriving in a new place, communication, shared or individual experiences, family memories, relationship with the land, loss and hope, relationships, values, creativity, and so on. You will need to work on developing your ability to locate the relevant ideas in the text and identify the features of language, whether it's visual, spoken, or written, that led to this particular understanding. The key ideas for short answers. 
or questions. So these are some of the questions that you need to think of and have at the back of your mind. How do texts explore individual and or collective experiences? So it's no use going to an exam and saying, well, I'll just go there and I don't have to study for the unseen because I'll go there and just see what they ask me to do. Now, you can't, you can't do that. It's better to go there with an understanding or if you like a prediction of the questions. So what constitutes an experience, for example, you need to know that is every event an experience. Does experience have to involve a change or process? Can the term experience simply refer to a key moment? Do we constantly have experiences or does experience have to be formative or memorable? What quality of emotions are explored within the text? How does storytelling help us to understand different lives and cultures? So storytelling is important. Human experiences are important. And these are some of the questions that we're getting and we need to look at a couple of past papers and understand them and let us go through them and prepare ourselves for this examination. Techniques for short answers. I want you to think about some techniques for short answers and then I'll continue with the next part of the talk. Okay, so we're looking at techniques for short answers. So short answers, different to an extended response, require us to succeed in smaller chunks. And therefore, we have to make quick decisions about which ones do we attack and spend more time on, which ones do we hold back from. We also have to have a body of knowledge that we can draw upon. We can't just assume that we'll get this question right. If it's worth two marks, it wants something substantially more than a one mark type question. And it might require some evidence. So let's look at some techniques for short answers. The first thing is, Everyone in this examination has 10 minutes of reading time. So it's very important that you use that time wisely. Now, 10 minutes is given because there's a lot of reading to get done. Now, we can read something fairly quickly, but we need to read it so that we get an understanding of what's going on. I always say when you read something, Always do a quick scan and say, okay, what text type is it? Let's look at the heading. Let's get a feel for what it's about. Then we do a, a closer reading. So a quick read just to get our finger on the pulse. The second read is to actually read with a more critical lens as we go over the text in view of the questions that we have to answer. So you, we need to focus firstly, and sometimes I might have a fingernail and I use it to mark the paper if there's something that catches my eye, but I'm not allowed to use a pen. So we open the reading book next to the questions, we have a look at it and we take our time. We read the questions as well. So. When we go over the close reading, we know what we are actually looking for. We look at the marks allocated for each question and organise the time proportionately. Obviously, if we have a question worth one mark, we spend less time on it. If a question's worth five or six marks, we spend more time on that question. I call those questions the discriminator questions. They're there deliberately to make sure that the top students get the most marks, the average students get a middle of the range mark, and the weaker students get a lower mark. So be aware of that. They've deliberately made those questions to target certain students and to make the exam fair, because some students 
need the opportunity to stretch out and show how good they are. But I always give it as a challenge to the weaker students. Be aware of that and try to push yourself to go to the next level. Read the unseen text for section one, being conscious of the questions. So you know the questions and we said you go back to that question and see what's there. Think about how the texts answer the questions for this section. Think about what each text says about human experiences and how it uses language and structure to make its point. You will need to be able to make a statement on human experiences, responding to the question and examples. You might name the language device, but it's more important to explain how the example develops the idea of human experience that you have stated. So if I say, well, they use a metaphor here, they use a personification. Well, so what? The identification is a lower order question, but the analysis of that identification is a higher order. So try to push yourself and always ask yourself, so what? Let me go a little bit further. And of course, um, try to use a black pen. Um, there's a reason they ask for a black pen. It's easier to read um, unless you've got special provisions. And it's like an instruction before you go into the exam. So it's like a small test of how committed you are to this particular task. Now, there's a way of tackling the short answer questions. Let's look at that and let's develop this technique. It uses the mnemonic CTQE. Sorry, the acronym. So now it deals with concept, C is for concept, T is for textual evidence, Q is for the question, Q is the quote, and E is the effect. So concept, what idea of notion about human experiences is the question asking you to foreground? You must specifically address this in your answer rather than writing generally about the concept. So you always have to have that human experience at the back of your mind when you look at all these things. The textual evidence, you need textual evidence for everything. Carefully choose the textual evidence that will support your idea about the human experience referred to in the question. You may want to name the language or visual feature in the evidence, but we need to say how the technique works to support the meaning. So concept, textual evidence, quote, and the effect. Quote, where possible, quote directly from the text to support the idea and the aspects of human experience you are discussing. So a big part of English is quotes. Have your quotes because they will always say, where did you get this idea from? Where did it come from? It has to come from somewhere. You have to put your finger on it. Now, the examiner knows that it's there, but you have to prove that you know that it's there. Effect, what meaning is made by the composer's choice of the language visual feature? What might it affect in the eyes of the responder? How does it communicate your ideas. Make sure your explanation of the textual evidence links directly to the notion of human experience referred to in the question. Do not necessarily have this in the exact order, C, T, Q, E, so long as it's there somewhere embedded in your answer. So let's look at some sample questions and answers. So a sample question could be, how does the poet capture the human experience of learning about the world around you? So let's look at how this person answers that. In this poem, Atwood expresses the importance of learning about the world, which she imparts in the tender tone apparent to a child. Atwood uses second person in 
you begin this way. This is your hand. This is your eye. This is your mouth. To convey the importance of knowing about yourself before you move into the world. The importance of individuals understanding the reality of conflict, hardship and destruction in the wider world are conveyed through vivid colour imagery in you are right to smudge it that way with red and then the orange, the world burns. Atwood ends the poem with tender tactile imagery suggesting that it is important for individuals to be gently guided to appreciate the beauty and complexity of the world. This is your hands. These are my hands. This is the world. So you can see that answer, how it has the concept. It has a quote. It has the effect. And it has the evidence. We need all those things. It's a very thorough response. And it's a response that you can do if you start practicing writing this way by looking at past exam papers. Another way we should look at is good sentences because we saw in the rubric that third section is how do we organize our writing? So let's look at some examples of good sentences. Um, sometimes we're, we're just so used to writing in such a way and no one's ever pulled us up about our writing style. But sentences are really the building blocks of writing. So let's have a look of our sentences and what makes a good sentence. I'll give you a few minutes just to have a look at that. So someone's come up with this idea of dias. Um, because we have to start looking at how do we write our sentences? Are we operating from the most basic level or are we going to the highest level? So they are description, interpretation, analysis, and synthesis. That's where we get the word dias from. Description, simply telling the reader what the text is about. It is a recount, full uh, of a plot summary or just describing a section closely. Interpretation means that you explain words and ideas. You apply some skills from your understanding. Analysis means that you go outside the text and search for ideas and meanings that link different parts of the text with values and beliefs in society. You are trying to work out the reasons for the composer's choices of language. The why has he chosen or she chosen this particular way of communicating to express the ideas in the text. Synthesis is the most difficult level of thinking as it requires you to start linking ideas from different parts of the text go outside the text to find connections. Synthesis builds on analysis, making links between different texts or linking ideas within a text. So there's some examples there of dias and how it works. So just have a look at those, then I'll read through them. Gow's play, Away, begins and ends with scenes from two Shakespearean plays, one comedy and one tragedy. So it's just basically telling us what it is. It's just a recount. Interpretation, through including both comic and tragic scenes from Shakespearean plays, Gow creates a sense of atmosphere and alludes to the simultaneously humorous and sobering nature of the characters' lives. We're going to more um, interpretation and explanation. Analysis. The composer's choice of a scene from King Lear simultaneously foreshadows Tom's 
tragic demise and reminds the audience of the potential for healing through acceptance. Synthesis. The intertextual references, in a way, create a pastiche of illusions, which, ga which allow Gal to subtly explore the character's quest in a changing and di divisive society. Try to develop your writing into analysis and synthesis wherever possible. Sometimes you can't do that, but that's what you need to be striving for. It's a, it's a different gear when you're driving a car, and some of you have got your license. If you drive a manual car, you'll realize it's a different gear will allow you to do different things. So synthesis is the top gear. And if you can get into that gear, that's where you should be aiming for in your exam. So let's look at the extended response section, which is section two. I want you to think about how you put together your extended responses before I start this topic. Now, the extended response is important because really paper one has an essay in section two. Paper two is made up really of two, possibly three essays. So we're writing potentially four essays in the English exam. So we need to know how to write extended responses. Now, there are different formats for this question and it's often a generic question and it won't re refer to a prescribed text as such, but it will ask you to use your prescribed text. So the question may be about this specific text, about the form or arising from a statement. Now, let me clarify, a specific text could be, or would be there for paper two, modules A and B, where they will refer to a specific text. Um, but, for section two, it'll be more a general question that is asked. So in this section, I will cover aspects to do also with paper two to help you with the writing of essays. Now there are different question formats. So let's look at them and we'll look at some examples of some questions. So we're familiar with these formats. There is discussion of a general statement. All right. Now, this question may start with a general statement or quotation, which relates to texts and human experiences, and a second statement directing you to what is needed to be answered. It could be thematic in nature or ask you to examine an aspect in the module description. For example, Texts reflect the lived experiences of diverse and vibrant individuals. Discuss this statement in relation to your prescribed text. So it's fairly general, as you can see. It's really saying, tell us what you do know about this topic. It's not there to trap you as such. It's there, it's an open-ended question, and it's asking you to write down as many things as you can. Give you some more discussion examples. Stories help us to understand different societies and ideas. In doing so, they encourage us to challenge and reflect on our own beliefs and values. Explore this statement with reference to your prescribed text. Human behavior is often paradoxical. Once again, these words are emerging and inconsistent because every individual has complex motivations. Examine this statement with close reference to your prescribed text. So you can see this idea of um, human, human experiences, human behavior, uh, the paradoxes, the challenge, all these things in the theme are coming out in these questions. So you need to be familiar with them. Or it could be a to what extent 
type question. Yeah, what extent is this true? A to what extent question may be triggered by a quotation or a statement and may require you to include a qualifying word. Now the words you would use would be greatly or significantly or to some degree. They're asking you to what extent. You may think of an alternative position, but dismissing the position offered in an examination question and supporting a very different position is not wise. Usually taking an alternative position requires a lot of risk and I wouldn't advise you doing that. So here's an example. Through exploring human experiences, stories encourage us to develop insights about the behavior and motivation of others. To what extent has your prescribed text presented you with new and challenging insights? Now that gets us back to that activity question, which we said, what do you have, what do you hold about human experiences that no one else does? So they're really strong statements that you can make in this question. To what extent has your prescribed text encouraged you to reflect on how individuals change and develop due to their experiences? So we'll just pause there and then we'll go through the other questions. So, okay, the next part of the session, we're looking at essay writing and we're down to the, um, we we're looking at uh, discussion questions and we're looking at to what extent questions. So the next one was an argument question. So this one here really is, is getting you to put up an argument and it would use verbs like how or examine in the question. So um, here are some examples to help you. Examine how Rosemary Dobson's poems explore the search for hope and grace, which is an important part of human experience. How does the examination of compassion and forgiveness in Arthur Miller's The Crucible depict both the positive and challenging aspects of human experience? Discuss how the journey undertaken by the participants in Go Back to Where You Came From enables them to understand and appreciate the diversity and complexity of human experiences. So as you can see, those questions have a common core, the idea of human experience. So how it could be, how was this seen in the text? So how, what is the particular aspect of human experience? How does Rosemary Dobson explore it in terms of giving us ideas from the poem and showing us what techniques she uses? So how is it means a development and it's also telling us, uh, show us evidence which makes that writer or composer effective in what they do. And the next one is question about form. Another possibility is a question that explores specific aspects of textual form in relation to your prescribed text. They could be general or specific to your text. So how has the textual form influenced the ideas, values and attitudes presented within your prescribed text? So that's an easy question, um, probably for modules um, A or B in paper two. The other one is, is more specific to human experience. However, it'll often be a generic human experience. But let's have a look at the next one. Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice examines the human experiences of rivalry, romance, and loyalty. How are aspects of comedy used to comment on social attitudes? Last one. 
How does I am Malala use a powerful first person narrative voice in her autobiography to explore the author's experiences of oppression and empowerment? So what we're saying here is these are the types of questions you can get. And you can get them in paper one or in paper two. If it's specific to a text, um, it'll be in paper one, if it's specific to a text, it'll be because it'll say, refer to your prescribed text. But we need to be aware of the different questions that we will be receiving. So once we are aware of them, we can start preparing for these types of questions. Then there's language device questions. A specific language feature within your text could be the focus of the question. So you can see <clears throat> you have to be ready for everything. That's really what they're saying. How does Orwell's 1984 use setting to represent the collective human experience of living in a dystopian regime? Discuss Doldry's use of juxt juxtaposition in the film Billy Elliot to portray the struggles and challenges experienced by the protagonist as he is confronted by new experiences. In Vertigo, Lowry uses imagery to vividly explore the natural environment and its effect upon the character's personal growth. Discuss how the setting enhances the portrayal of human experiences. Or it could be an extra, extract question where they give us a particular part of a book or a play of a text and we are asked to um, discuss it or answer an extended response question to that. For example, there's an extract there. Central to the Shakespearean drama, The Merchant of Venice, is the idea of judgment and the way it affects our humanity. Discuss the role of judgment in the play, The Merchant of Venice. In your answer, you will need to refer to the extract above. So they're the different types of essays you can get. To what extent presenting an argument, discussion, and extract something about language. So there's quite a diversity. Let's look at how to put essays together because this is essential for paper one and for parts of paper two. Now, the essay is timed. So what I would advise you do is when you practice your essays, time yourself writing your essay. Never memorize a whole essay memorize 80% of an essay because you always need to adapt it to the particular question that you've been given. And you fall into the trap of just regurgitating your essay and the examiner will know that. If you do not answer the question, you will not get a mark that you'll be happy with. You might pass, but you won't get more than that. They will know straight away that you've memorized that essay. So it's a good idea that um, the introduction, especially and the conclusion, they're things that have to be adaptable to the question. You might have the body of the question and certain points for your essay ready before you uh, sit for that exam. So it's good to time yourself when you are practicing to pick up a pen, get a piece of paper and to write what you remember. Now, my first time you write it, you might give yourself, you know, more time. It might be 50 minutes or an hour. Then as you get better at it, you will be surprised. Once the essay is in your head, how quickly you can write it down. I've seen people write an essay. Once they know the chunk of that essay, most of that essay, they can write it in about 20, 25 minutes very easily. But in the exam, if you have to think on your feet, it could, could take you up to an hour to write a good essay. 
And even then, it's not as polished as you would like. Now, read and highlight your notes. Select the key ideas and have them ready because there's a lot of things in your essay, but you don't need all the words. All you need are the main words, the key words, the key ideas. Um, otherwise, you'll fall into the trap of just memorizing word for word. And when you memorize word for word, if something does go wrong, if you crash in the exam, you'll forget everything. So it's better that you know the key ideas and then you can expand upon those ideas. After reading the set question, write down your ideas in point form. Put the most important ideas first and then the least important last. Um, don't worry too much about quotations, you can put them in later. I always say prioritise your ideas because sometimes in an exam you do run out of time. so. It's no use putting your best idea at the end and running out of time when it could have been done at the very beginning. So prioritize your work. So once you put all your, your ideas down, you know, and this is in writing essays, you have to try to group these ideas together into categories. Because some people say brainstorm. Brainstorm's good. It puts all your ideas out there on paper and you need that as part of essay writing in general. But then it comes to a point where you have to start gathering these ideas and then seeing the links between these ideas. Once you start gathering these ideas, they fall under an umbrella and these become the topic sentences and the body paragraphs. But then you can find connections with those ideas and they become the connective um, phrases or points that gives your essay a greater sense of unity. Now, some people use subheadings, some people use color coding, it's up to you. Now, obviously you can't do that um, color coding and all that. I prefer that you do it when you're planning essays, not necessarily in the exam itself but um, using a different color pen is useful. Um, and you don't need that many ideas in your essay. You might need three to five main points. Each of the main points becomes a body, uh, a topic sentence for your body paragraph. And when you're looking at a question, always try to come up with similar words to the words used in the question. Why? Because you don't want to use the same word in the question over and over and over again. It just becomes monotonous and boring. And it shows the examiner that you don't have a diverse vocabulary. So it's always good to find similar words or synonyms for the key words used in the question. Now, if you're not in an exam, you can use a thesaurus to help you put those ideas together. So in an exam itself, you've got 40 minutes, but I also believe in that 40 minutes, you need to spend some time planning. The best essays we have are when people plan their ideas and they put their ideas together. So planning gives the essay more polish. So what do you do? What do you take with you in the exam? You need to take quotations and key themes. So what I tell people to do sometimes, if you've got the quotation and you know it, the first thing you should do in the exam is write write the quotations out. So they're not floating around in your head and creating confusion. You also need to have specific events from the text, which relate to what you are studying, relate to the concepts that you are studying. Then, of course, you have to adapt these ideas to the question. 
The question doesn't have to adapt to you. You have to adapt to the question. Now, you have to respond properly to the question. Now, most of the people say to me, sir, I answered the question. Yes, you answered part of the question. And then it becomes, to what extent did you answer this question? To a great extent, you'll get more marks. Everyone answers the question. But it gets down to that part that we spoke about. Did you analyse and synthesise is um, the question. Did you unpack that information into an, a complex integrated response? So you have to integrate your ideas in your introduction. But I also say don't write your introduction first. Write it after you've got the main points out and you know from the main points what your argument is, then you can write your introduction. We said write synonyms, that's important for the exam as well, um, which is the part where you show your flair as a writer. And topic sentences are important. So I don't think, when you're playing, you should do your topic sentences first, because from your topic sentences will come your arguments and then will come your introduction. Some people start their introduction first and then hope everything falls together. Whereas the introduction should be the crowning achievement of their work. It should summarize their work. You can't summarize something that you don't know. Then you write your essay and the conclusion is very important. You must sum up and connect the arguments and you must not introduce new ideas to the essay. Okay, so I'll just give a quick summary about essay writing because essay writing is key to, we said we could have 80 out of 100 marks come from the extended response or essay writing. So I'll just quickly go over those points again and some tips on essay writing. After your reading, highlight the keywords and phrases. There are always keywords and phrases in the question. I always say read the question three or four times if you have to. Then when, once you've read it, brainstorm. Put these ideas down that are floating in your head. Now, there are directive words in the question. So remember what the directive word is. You've brainstormed. Now you've got the directive words. Now you start to put key points together based on those directive words and your brainstorming. So it's a different function of thinking. And then you can start putting together an argument. So number the points from the most important to the least important. Then when, once you have these points, put a piece of textual evidence for each. Now in the exam, we spoke about the technique, put your quotes down and all your ideas because that gets it out of your head. Now your brain can concentrate on putting these ideas together, not juggling with evidence but the evidence will be there for you to see and use as you see fit. Then once you've got your points numbered from the most important to the least important, then put your thesis argument together. Put your argument and your argument will sound more confident because you've gone through the points, you've gone through the evidence and you'll, you'll say, yes, I know i put this point, but I can back it up with this particular piece of evidence. Now you're ready to do your introduction. And then you can do your conclusion. So your introduction is like the top bread roll of your hamburger bun. And your conclusion is the bottom bread roll of your hamburger bun. 
So I hope these slides have helped you. There is a lot to this course and it'll only come with practice, but these questions and an understanding of these questions and the rubric should put you in great stead for this English exam. Good luck, work hard, and if you put the hard work in, you will achieve the results. Take care.